Come on, we're here at church on a Sunday. Come on. I say in church, you're sounding good. I like that. I like the energy. I like to scream myself. I'm going to try not to do it too much today. I promise it's going to be a good time. Um, just like Pastor T said, my name is Brandon. I'm the director of ministries here at Ascent Church, and we are so grateful to have you here in the house. My hope and my heart for today is that you guys are challenged. You're able to leave out of here hearing God's word and being able to take some action steps away from here. But before we dive in, before we start talking about it, I would love to just uh, shout out our online community. Can we give it up for them? They can hear you in the house. Something that's so cool that I think we can often miss being here is the fact that we're literally sharing the gospel way beyond these walls. It's literally going all over the world, which I just think is the coolest thing to be a part of. Um, and lastly, like he said, Pastor T, he said that he was off this week. I love that he's able to rest. I love that he's able to be with family and prepare for a very big series next week. Can we just show some love to Pastor T? I know many of us, just like myself, we're so grateful for just um, his energy, his excitement, the way that he brings the word each and every Sunday. He invests in so many of us, and we just love him to death. Um, today, what I want to talk about a little bit is um, the holidays are right around the corner, right? It's a very busy season typically, right about now. It's a busy season, and a lot of us, when the holidays come around, we're freaking out. We're like, we don't know what to do. We got to prepare for Christmas. Some of you guys have already set out your Christmas decorations. That's crazy, but we're moving into the holiday season right now, and it gets really crazy, but I think that it's not just the holiday season. I think in general, Something that we struggle with, each and every one of us, is we struggle, for, uh, we struggle with sorry, disconnecting. We struggle with unplugging. We struggle with actually resting. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because some of us, we charge our phones more than we charge our souls. You like that? That was funny. I like it. You know, we fill up our gas tanks, but we live a life and we lead a life on empty Day after day, and a lot of us today are probably so exhausted, we're so tired, and I want to talk about practically how do we do this, because I think so many of us were like, once I get to that vacation, then I could recharge, right? Once I get to that long weekend, then I'll actually be able to rest and unplug, but how come every time we come back from those trips, we're almost more tired than when we left? So I'm going to talk about what does scripture say about rest, what does it say about rest. I heard this um, a little while ago, and I just thought it was so impactful, and I want this to kind of set the stage for all of us here in this place. Um, the fact that man was created on the sixth day in Genesis, the following day was the seventh day, right? And on the seventh day, what do we know that God did? He rested. And what does that mean for us? That means that the day that we were created on the sixth day, the very next day, the very first full day that we had here on earth was a day of rest, and I don't think God made a mistake there. I think he was very intentional to show that, hey, we shouldn't be living from a place of emptiness. Instead, let's live from a place of overflow. Let's put rest first, and a lot of us put rest last. I want to read Genesis 2-1 over you real quick. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day, and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So that's what we're talking about today. If you're tired today, if you're exhausted today, you're in good company, because I would say many of us are. Let's pray together. Father, I just ask that here in this place you challenge us through your word, and God, that today we can leave out knowing how to truly rest, how to truly unplug, how to actually charge our souls, how do we actually fill up our tanks so we are not living and leading from a place of emptiness, but instead leaving from a place of overflow. Father, I ask that you work on some hearts today, those that are exhausted from parenting, those are that, that are exhausted from work, God, I just ask that you work in their hearts today. Father, we love you so much, we're so grateful for all you're doing, it's in your name we pray, amen, amen. Um, so, um, about a month ago, about a month ago, Pastor T came up, came up to me and was like, hey, 
Brandon, I want you to preach on November 6th. And I was like, great, love the opportunity, really excited about it. And I kind of got an idea of like what he was preaching on, right? I was like, what are you doing in October? What are you doing in November? So I can kind of do like a standalone thing. And when I first committed to November 6th and said, I'm going to do rest, um, I did not plan that it was daylight savings time. So some of you are here today and you're like, I'm well rested. I'm ready to go. And I was like, that's some poor planning on my part. I apologize for that. But I'm going to tell you something. This day is not normal for us. All right? This day is not normal. We don't always get an extra hour of sleep. So hopefully you are rested. But I would say majority of the time we are not. And as I was talking with Pastor T, you always know he got some good jokes. Um, we're talking about it. And he was like, Brandon, you got to do this. And I was like, I don't really want to. He was like, you got to. And I was like, all right, I'll do it. So where are my gym people at? Where you at? Okay, all right. Some gym people in the house. Some of you guys say, hey, my favorite day at the gym is chest day, right? Some of you guys say, hey, my favorite day at the gym is back day. Am I doing it right? Is this right? Okay. Some of you guys say, hey, my favorite day at the gym, leg day, right? Well, I'm here to tell you my favorite day at the gym is rest day. Haven't been to the gym in four months, and I'm excited about it. When I get back in the gym, I'm going to be ready to go. I just need everyone to understand that my favorite day is rest day. Stop joking. I don't want to see anything on Instagram, because I know how you guys do. You troll us. That's okay. I want to see it, all right? Rest day. What does this mean for us? How do we rest? And I think we have to clearly define what rest is before we can truly understand how do we actually rest daily. Rest is this, it says cease work or movement in order to relax. The reason that this is so important to understand is a lot of us think that when we relax, we're resting, right? A lot of us think that when we unplug, maybe watch TV, play video games or whatever, we're like, hey, we're resting. According to this definition, we are not resting because rest has to come before relaxing. By definition, rest has to come before relaxing. So where we're going to be at today is a common passage that probably majority of you have heard, and I don't want you to tune out to this. I want you to lean in because my hope and my heart is that God challenges us here through this scripture. We're going to be in Matthew 14, 22. It's where Jesus and Peter walk on water. And what I want to point out is what's happened before this, because I want to give some context, is the feeding of the 5,000 just happened. So Jesus just did this miraculous thing. He's multiplying loaves of bread. He's multiplying fish. He's handing out to people. He's feeding literally 5,000 people. But what we see, and I think is so cool, is that there's seven mentions of Jesus resting in the New Testament, where he actually steps back and he says, hey, I need to recharge, I need to be in the presence of God. And the reason that that's significant is because in Matthew 14, it happens twice. Once before the feeding of the 5,000, and now we're going to see it happen before Jesus walks on water. And I don't think that that's a mistake that he literally rested before being able to pour out to so many. 14.22, you can follow on the screen behind me or in your Bible. 14.22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, after he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. Someone say alone. Alone. He was there alone. We're going to talk a little bit today. It's going to be good. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So I want to paint the picture for you. The boat's gone. Jesus is on a hill. His disciples are not with him. He is utterly alone on a mountainside. And I was like, hey, Jesus is great at resting, but who else is great at resting? Because I was kind of thinking through, like, who do I know that's really great at unplugging and resting? And I came to the conclusion that it's dads. Dads could have utter chaos happening in the house. And they're like, my team's winning. You see that? Right? Dads could literally be in the middle of the night. This is me, by the way. I'm not just trolling all dads. This is me, too. Okay, middle of the night, baby's crying, everyone's freaking out, and we're like, passed out cold, all right? Dads are exceptional at resting, and I always commit to this, if you've ever heard me preach or speak, people give me a hard time, they're like, Brandon, you always troll your dad, and I was like, I've got to double down today, I've got to double down today, who is the best dad at resting? My dad, my dad is an exceptional rester, and what do I mean by that? 
I want you to understand this. When we were little kids, my dad, this was the era, some of you may not remember this, where people would actually come to your door, ring the doorbell, and be like, hey, I'd like to hang out, okay? This was that era, so that way you understand what's going on here. My dad would handwrite a sign, do not ring doorbell, baby sleeping. And he put it right over the doorbell. Clutch move. If any dads want a nap, that's what you do, all right? So he put that on the doorbell, right? And you're like, oh, that's cute. Y'all are babies. He's looking out for y'all. I want to prove this a little bit further. We're teenagers. <laughs> I'm driving home from school, and I pull up, and I walk up to the front door, and it's like, baby sleeping, do not ring doorbell. And I'm like, there's not even a baby in the house. The baby's my dad. My dad's the baby. And just to take it a little bit further, because you're like, it can't get any worse than that. Oh, it can it can. We were taking my son over to stay the night at my parents' house. He's a baby. I walk up to the front porch, and I'm like, I thought this sign died. I thought this sign was done with. I thought it was over. I'm walking up with the baby, and it says, do not ring doorbell, baby sleeping. And I'm like, the baby's right here. I, have, I want to be sleeping. That's what I want. My dad is a master at resting, but all jokes aside, what I want to show you is that Jesus gives us the example of rest and how we do it. And I think we have it kind of flipped. I think we kind of have it a little reversed. What I want you to see here is that Jesus was alone, right? Jesus was alone. He prayed to God. Jesus went to desolate places to pray. We often go to busy places to be preoccupied. We just numb what's happening in our life. Everyone was like, hmm, we do. We scroll on our phones constantly. We're more connected and plugged in than ever before, and we don't think it's a problem. We don't think it's a problem. We're like, hey, it's a good thing that we're connected, and it is. But we have now made it an ultimate thing where we have to have our phone every second of the day. I do it. You do it. And something that's so interesting is that we just go to busy places to be preoccupied. We just go to busy places to say, hey, I'm going to numb what's going on in my workplace for a little bit. I'm going to scroll my phone. I'm going to numb this issue, this situation that I'm having with parenting, and I'm going to scroll a little bit, right? We go to video games. We go to TV. We go to so many different things that are not actually rest. It's just a temporary fix. It's almost like a drug for us, if you will. I want to share this study with you that I think is just so interesting. At the end of the study, they're looking at people who are super connected, which is all of us, and they said television, video games, movies, and social media are artificial stimulation. When you engage in these activities, your brain is not resting. Let me say that again if anyone hasn't heard it. Your brain is not resting. Resting, it's being bombarded with information, even if it is entertainment, and becoming even more tired. So we've got to flip it. We've got to flip it back. We've got to go and spend time with Jesus. That's what he's trying to show us here in this passage. We're going to keep reading verse 25. It says, shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them. Doing what? He was walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost. They said, and they cried out in fear. They cried out in fear. Something, this is where my brain goes, and this is probably just me being weird, but I see Jesus like strolling out, you know. He may be doing like a mall power walk type thing to try to catch up to the boat. Because for me, I'm like, this boat left a while ago. Like, this boat's gone. How did Jesus catch up to it? That's my question. That's what I want to know. I'm like, how did Jesus just walk like this? And he's like, "Mm -hmm." he's kicking some little water things around because it's not rocks. I'm like, how in the world did he catch up to the boat? And something that's so interesting about this is that Jesus was never rushed. Jesus was never rushed. He had the most important and urgent mission literally on earth that he was only able to do for three years, and he was still walking. It's so interesting to me. He was still walking. I think a lot of us lose rest. We're like chaotic. We like to run places. We're like, we got to get here. We got to get the family over to this place. I've got to go to this party. I've got to go do this sporting event. We're constantly just piling up our schedules, and we are such a rushed society. And I think the thing that we potentially lose rest over the most is our purpose. And Christians are the best at this. They're like, just step into your purpose. God has a purpose for your life. And you're like, what does that mean? Like, what is the purpose? How do I find it? You'll, You'll know. You'll know when he says it. And it's like, 
what are you saying? It doesn't make any sense. I want to kind of address that right now because I think we lose a lot of rest. We're like, once I have X amount of dollars, then I'll be set. And then I'll be able to do what my purpose is and what I want to step into and what I believe God has for my life. Hey, once I get to this place, once I'm married, once I have kids, okay, now I'm in my purpose. Now I'm in my sweet spot. I want to tell you that right now, where you are planted is your purpose. Stop waiting for the future. Stop waiting for tomorrow. Right now, as a parent, as a spouse, at your job, right now is your purpose to stop acting like it's somewhere out in the distance god has placed you in this specific place and so many of us this is going to be hard to hear so many of us are going to miss our purpose because we're focused on tomorrow and tomorrow is never going to come tomorrow is never going to come so my challenge for you is stop being rushed and start being intentional with where god has placed you stop being rushed to fill your schedule up. Stop being rushed to do all of these things right here and now because you're like, I got to do it all. Otherwise, I'm going to miss out. It's a lie that the enemy has placed in our lives so that we will never actually be in our purpose because we're waiting for it tomorrow. Because we're waiting for it tomorrow. I love this quote. I want to share it with you guys. I feel like it's so powerful. What does it mean by the fact that if you don't plan your time, someone else will help you waste it? What he's saying there is that, hey, if you don't have a schedule, if you don't plan quiet time, if you don't plan time to spend with your kids, if you don't schedule a date night with your spouse, if you don't schedule time to serve in the church and make a difference in this community and make a difference in this world, if you don't make that time intentional, what's going to happen? Someone else is going to say, hey, come to this party. Let's go hang out for a bit. Right? They're going to pull us all around, and you will look back at the end of your life. You'll say, I wasted it. I had so many opportunities with my spouse, and I wasted it. So many opportunities with my kids, I wasted it. Let us not be a people who are rushed. Let us not be a people who let other people waste our time. Let's be intentional with our purpose and the time that God has given us now and where he's placed us today. That's the challenge. Verse 27. We're going to keep going. We're going to talk a little bit more. But Jesus immediately said, someone say said. 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 Thank you. He said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Easy response for Jesus. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, and he walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink He cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, I'm drowning. I'm sinking. God, save me. And I think this is where a lot of us are right now. We're like, our schedules are so busy. I'm sinking with every responsibility that I have. I kind of want to address something here before we can actually focus on how do we actually rest. And it's the question of why are we so overwhelmed? And I would say with not every situation, but I would say the vast majority of these situations that are in our lives where we feel overwhelmed, a lot of it's self-inflicted. A lot of it is because we can't say no. We say yes to everything. A lot of why we are so overwhelmed is because we do it to ourselves. We don't have a plan. We don't have a schedule. We don't plan with our finances. And we look around and we are like, what is going on? It's almost like life, life is happening to us rather than us happening to our life and what we see here is Peter as he's stepping out he's looking to the side he's focused on Jesus for a moment and he's taking some steps he's good but when he starts looking away he starts looking at circumstances what happens he starts to sink and someone needs to hear this today because someone today is like Brandon I've walked in with a lot of stuff 
I've walked in with this divorce that's looming over me. I've walked in with this addiction that's over me. I've walked in where I feel like I'm not enough. I feel like maybe I'm not a good parent. I'm not a good spouse. I'm kind of lonely right now. You're walking in with a bunch of stuff, and I want to remind you today that your circumstances are not greater than your God. Let me say that once more. That divorce is not greater than your God. That addiction is not greater than your God. Whatever you could possibly face here on earth is not greater than your God. It's not greater than your God. So stop acting like it is. Stop acting like it is. And I think once we understand that, once we understand that our God's all-powerful, and he is greater than our circumstances, I think we could start diving into how do we actually rest. Immediately, Jesus reached. Someone say reached. Reached. They reached out his hand, called him. He said, you have little faith, he said. And I don't think this is a jab, because I think we look at this and we're like, oh, Jesus is kind of bucking up on him a little bit, right? It's kind of like a little laugh. It's like, you're walking fine. Like, what are you doing? That's kind of what's happening right here in this passage. It's not a jab. He's like, Why, why'd you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat and the wind died down, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. I love that picture. He gets them back in the boat. Everyone starts falling at Jesus' feet. They say, Truly, you are the Son of God. And what I want to show you today is that Jesus was able to invest, because this was an investment moment for his disciples. He was able to teach his disciples. He was able to perform miracles for people, not from a place of emptiness, like a lot of us live our life, but ultimately from a place of what? Of overflow. He was able to do it from a place of overflow. Our staff, we went on a little retreat recently. Went on a little retreat. Sometimes it gets a little crazy. We drove an RV out into the mountains. That was a situation. (laughs) And on the way home, I was tasked to drive it back. I've never driven an RV. I don't know what I'm doing. I'm driving back, and I'm talking to one of our um, newest staff members, Allie. We celebrated her a few weeks ago, and we're having this conversation. I'm talking through this message. I'm like, hey, you know, um, I'm really excited about this. I feel like this is hopefully going to resonate and speak to some people today. And as we're having this conversation, I'm kind of laying out like, you know, I'm, I'm feeling super convicted by this. Like, this message is for me because I constantly will sit at home. I'll get home from work. I'm like mentally drained. I'm like, I just need to sit back and scroll my phone. And my son will come up and he'll be like, dad, dad, put phone in pocket. I'm like, I hear you loud and clear. And that's really convicting for me because I was sitting there and I'm like scrolling right as he's playing in front of my face. And I'm like, I'm literally not doing this. I'm literally not doing this. And I was explaining that to her. I said, I have some practical ways that I want to challenge people with today. And I have some good ones but I had this realization, and I'll share, the, I'll share it with you so it's not like this cliffhanger thing. Um, I was going to say, hey, your phone, put on do not disturb at a specific time so only like your family can get through to you and take it a step further. Maybe it's taking your phone and placing it in your bedroom while you're out there with the family. Hey, prioritize a date night with your spouse every week, every other week. Like make it a thing and be intentional with it. I was going to say that. I was going to say, hey, maybe for you, where you are right now, you say yes to everyone. Maybe for you, it's to start saying no to a few people. I think it's so crazy that there are literally books out there. My wife's grandmother gave me one because she knows how bad I am at this. It literally says, start saying no and stop feeling guilty about it. And I'm like, how are people making millions of dollars? Because we are so bad at actually making a schedule at actually being intentional with where God has placed us today. And those are going to be like my practical things. When Allie and I were talking, I was like, this is it. This is what I'm going to share with people. And God kind of took me this week. And he said, Brandon, I feel like you've missed a pretty big part. Brandon, I feel like you kind of missed the mark in preparing for this. You see, my, uh, my daughter earlier this week, while we were on our trip, Um, Or let me go back a little bit. So my daughter, um, on Tuesday, I took her to CHKD Urgent Care. Um, I took her there because she was um, having, like, the symptoms of RSV, which a lot of parents know that for a younger child, um, that's a lot, right? That's a lot. And so she's showing these symptoms. She's having trouble breathing. She's having trouble breathing. So I take her to CHKD Urgent Urgent Care, um, like I said, on Tuesday. 
and they, we get there, and they're like, yep, you know, she looks like she's having difficulty breathing, but the good news is her stats are still good. And I was like, all right, thank you for putting this in my language. And so uh, Friday, we had a follow-up appointment where it was like a well appointment. It was already on the schedule. My wife calls and is like, hey, can we still come even though she's sick, and can we still um, get her seen for RSV because we think that she might have it? She wasn't officially diagnosed with it until um, Friday, but we kind of knew that she had it, right? And so Friday comes around. My wife takes her. I'm on this retreat. I'm having a good time, and all I could think about is my daughter, little baby Reagan, who's four months old, and she's struggling to breathe. Um, She takes them, and at that appointment, she's like, hey, she's still good. She's still good. That's the good news, Um, but we can tell that she's having trouble. We can tell that she's having trouble breathing. So they gave us this breathing treatment, and it, like, you had to put a mask on them. You have like a little pump and it puts steam out of it with this mixture of medicine that goes in. If you ever give in a kid medicine, it's really difficult, by the way. It's really hard. They squirm everywhere. And so for her, I was like, I have to be the first one to give this on Saturday when my wife's at work. I was like, dad's rest. We don't do this. Just kidding. That was a joke. (laughs) Um, So what we did is Saturday, I laid her on the changing table. I was like, this is how we're going to do it dad's way. Lay her on the changing table. I put the little mask over her. Start pumping it, and she is freaking out. She's squirming. She's moving. And I'm like this with the little mask. I'm like, oh gosh. I have to say some jokes because it's really sad. And so I take her, and I'm like, well, maybe the swing will, like, soothe her, and then I can sit in front of it and, like, hold it on her face. And so I tried that. She's freaking out. She's all over the place, right? What I ended up doing after that, I said, okay, I don't know how I'm going to, like, do this whole maneuver thing, but I'm going to pick her up, I'm going to put her in my arm, and I'm going to put the mask on her. And it was in that moment, she stopped freaking out, she started chilling a little bit, she started resting. She wasn't moving her face all around, she just started breathing. She started breathing. And in that moment, I said, God, I hear you. How did I miss that? How did I miss that from this story? You see, I told you to say said. I told you to say reached. Because what did Jesus do? He said, come to me, Peter. Come on, I'm going to speak to you. And then the second that he fell, he picked him up. He said, hey, I'm going to reach for you. I'm going to reach down for you. And in that moment, it clicked. I said, what did I start doing? I reached. I picked her up. I brought her in. I started singing over her. I'm not going to do that for you guys. I'm terrible. But I started singing over her. And it was in that moment that she was calm. She didn't understand why the mask was on her. She didn't understand the circumstances. But she said, I know my dad well enough to know he's going to take care of me. I believe that's what Jesus is saying to each and every one of us. And you may be like, hey, Brandon, I've tried to hand stuff over to God. I asked him once to bless my marriage. It ended in a divorce. I asked him one time to help me with my addiction. It didn't help. I'm more addicted now than ever before. Hey, I tried to trust God in this lonely season I was in. I feel more alone and depressed than ever before. I want to challenge you with one thing because I think this is the key to it all. This is how we rest. If you're like, hey, what is it? I want to know this is it. This is it. For some of you guys, you need to ask him again. You need to ask him again. You need to lean on God again. You need to say, hey, God, I know that divorce is in the past, but it still haunts me. It's still hard for me. God, restore that, which was broken. Maybe for you, it's this addiction that you tried to take to him. Ask him again. Ask him again. And you're like, Brandon, what if I ask him again and he doesn't answer? I'm going to double down with it and say, ask him again. Ask him again, because this is not a genie thing. This is not, hey, a vending machine God. This is a God who we say, hey, God, I'm bringing everything to you. When it's not pretty, when it's hard, when it's difficult, I'm going to stand in your presence. Why? Because you're the one that gives me rest. Because you're the one that designed us to be in rest. You designed us in our mother's womb for this season. So we could be intentional with all these different things, but it puts it on us. When Peter started walking, he looked at his circumstances. He said, I can control this. 
right? I can control my marriage. I can control this season of depression. I can control this addiction and eventually it gets so heavy what happens. We sink. We sink just like Peter did. We sink just like he did. So I want to tell you if he doesn't answer you in the way that you want, he will always answer you in the way that you need it. You may not like it. It may not be a popular way of answering a prayer. But I can promise you, you'll look back and see his faithfulness all through that season. Ask him again. Now, I knew that wouldn't be enough. I knew it wouldn't be enough. So I want to talk a little bit more. I want to close out with this verse because I think this is, this is it. This is it. Revelation 2, 4, the end of the Bible. Revelation's the last book. We talked about creation. Now we're talking about the end. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. So what's the answer? What's the answer? Some translations, they say you have left the love you had at first. I love what the commentary says because I think it brings it all together. It says the distinction between leaving and losing is so important. It's so important. Something can be lost quite by accident. But leaving is a deliberate act. Though it may not happen suddenly, though we may take steps away from God, slowly but surely, we may distance ourselves from Him. It's not an accident. We've intentionally done that. We've left Him. As well, when we lose something, is the encouraging part. We don't know where to find it. You lose your keys, you lose your wallet, you're like, where the heck did I lose that? But when you leave something, we know exactly where to find it. We know exactly where to find it. And what I'm saying is, we have left the love we had at first. So what do we do? We turn back to the love you had at first. The love that says you are chosen. The love that said that I see you in your shame. I see you in your past. I see you with your struggle and you are enough. You see, Jesus speaks through this. He said, and he reaches, and I've, I've never heard this preached about this, this story before, but I think it's so important. It's this idea that Peter, he stepped out of the boat, he sunk, we established that. But what about going back to the boat? What about going back to the boat? I don't think that Jesus is like dragging him, and he's like, blah, 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 like drowning or anything. I think he literally picks him up, he's back on water. He's back on a firm foundation. And what does he do? He walks with the Savior back onto the boat. And they step back into the boat together. And I love that picture that Jesus said, hey, I'm not just going to pick you up. I'm not just going to drag you along. I'm going to walk with you. Just ask me again. And turn back to the love you had at first. So why can't we rest? Because we've left the one who created rest. We left the one who designed us for rest. And what I want to do today, my heart is that you don't just leave here changed, but that you leave here restored in Jesus. We're going to worship in a moment. And I want us to give our God everything that he deserves as we worship him. With our arms stretched out just like he did on the cross. That's the gospel. Is this, this picture of Jesus hanging on the cross with his arms stretched wide saying, hey, come to me. My yoke is easy. My burden is so light. I have room for you. I have room for you. So I want to pray over you today. With every head bowed and eyes closed, I want to give some people an opportunity today. Who are like, Brandon, I don't know what it means to have a relationship with God. I don't know what it means to actually live my life for Jesus. We want to be a church to come alongside you. We want to walk through that with you, but I want to pray for you first. If you want to take that step to start a relationship with Jesus right here in this place, I want to help you do that. You say something like this, say a prayer like this. Father, I want to know you. Father, I know I've been stuck in my sin. Father, I know that I have left you, that I have walked away from you. But God, I want to be made right by you. I want to repent for my sins. God, because for so long I've said you're not enough, but today I want to say you are more than enough for me. And God, I want to follow you all the days of my life. If you prayed something like that, 
I don't want to embarrass you. I don't want to do anything weird. I just want to pray specifically for you here in this place. I'm going to pray over those that are struggling with rest because I think we all are. But I'm going to ask you to do something bold. Would you shoot your hand up in the air? No one's looking but me. If you made that decision today to follow Jesus, just put your hand up in the air real quick. Put it right back down. Thank you so much. I see you. Father, for those that made this commitment for the very first time, God, I ask that you can work on their hearts, God, that we could be a church to come alongside them. And God, I ask that from this day forward, they can see your faithfulness, they can see you working in their hearts. God, it may not be easy, but we know it's always worth it. And for those in this place who maybe have known you for a long time and they've left you, God, I ask that today they can turn back to the love they had at first and the one who created rest and the one who created a place for us to find joy again and to find peace. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful for what you're doing here in this place. It's in your name we pray. Amen.